what a week. Um, the first question, I would just love for you to sum up if you can, maybe in a sentence or two, what is your reaction to what's happened this week? Combination of Fed policy error uh, and individual bank uh, risk management failures. Uh, so I see a lot of people blaming, you know, either the banks or blaming the Fed exclusively. Uh, whereas, like m like most things, it's a mix, uh, and so basically, it's a whole, it's kind of a toxic policy combination and just ind individual bank mismanagement. Are we at the beginning of another real financial crisis? I don't think not in the same way in 2008. Um, I, in some ways, it has parallels to the 2019 uh, repo rate spike, uh, which not everybody's familiar with. Um, but it's it's more severe than that, but not as severe as 2008, uh, at least in the United States. And the way I would the reason I would describe it like that is 2008 was really a credit problem, which means that banks uh, made very aggressive and ultimately bad bets. They they lent money to entities that defaulted. Uh, whereas here, we're not really seeing that. It's not like they got overly aggressive um, and made bad loans that are defaulting. Instead, what they did was they ironically bought very, very safe assets, um, but they bought them at high prices, meaning low yields. And as yields have gone up at like a multi-decade high uh, rate, a year-over-year -year rate, a lot of those securities are now underwater in price. And it's actually fine if they're able to hold on long enough because those securities will pay back all their money, or at least you know the, the vast majority of them. The problem is that if they can't hold on long enough, if, if their deposits get pulled out and they have to sell their assets for a loss, that's when they you know they basically make those losses real. Uh, kind of a secondary and longer term problem is that if the, if um, deposits flow out of smaller banks and towards the larger banks or the money market funds, then those smaller banks have to raise deposit rates in order to entice capital to stay there. Um, and then the risk there is that they hurt their profitability because they're holding these low yielding assets, um, you know, probably till maturity. Uh, at the same time as they're paying out higher deposit rates. So I would say this is essentially a shock to the system when you raise rates this rapidly, uh, and then it kind of finds out which which banks manage that that exposure better than others. Well, let's dig in a little bit with uh, Silicon Valley Bank, because that was sort of the first domino and exactly what you just mentioned happened. They essentially bought these long duration bonds because they were chasing yield in a zero interest rate policy environment. And then they had to go sell them when uh, depositors came and wanted to, to get their money out. Can you paint the picture of, you know, pandemic started, fiscal stimulus goes into motion, and all of a sudden you have PPP loans and stimulus checks, and those are all going to these banks, right? So that's that's where all of a sudden they were flush with cash. They were buying up these treasury securities. And then when did the problem sort of surface as the interest rate hike started? Sure. Yeah. Basically to zoom out, you know, there is like that 40% uh, increase in the broad money supply in a very short period of time. And most of that broad money supply is bank deposits. So banks, you know, even, even though those are customer funds, those are liabilities for the bank and they're holding them for the, the customer. So they, they basically had an influx of deposits and they had to invest them in something. Um, and, you know, a lot of them put them into relatively safe securities, things like treasuries or, or mortgage backed securities, which are among the safest assets that a bank can hold. Um, the problem is that they, you know, those have duration, right? So they might be like five year, 10 year or longer um, duration assets. And, you know, you had this record increase in the broad money supply, super low rates, and then it, it led to inflation, among other factors. And so the, the Federal Reserve uh, freaked out and completely, you know, 180 degree reversed their monetary policy. So they started sucking money out of the system and they started hiking rates at the fastest rate since the 1970s. Um, and so all these banks that, that that bought these longer duration safe assets suddenly found their positions underwater. Um, now, there's two big risk factors that go into why this particular bank had such a big problem. One was that their deposits were not very high quality because they were concentrated in one industry, uh, you know, tech startups. And because they're mostly business bank accounts, most of them were well above the FDIC limit. Um, and so they had, you know, a, you know, their risk of loss if there should be a bank failure. And so they're, they're basically deposits that are very, very uh, quick to want to move 
at any sign of a problem, which is not the case when you have a very diversified uh, and smaller, you know, kind of a large number of small accounts. Uh, so one is their deposit base was at risk. And the number two is they, they, they did not manage their duration well. You know, a, a bank like J.P. Morgan, for example, uh, you know, got more into shorter duration types of assets, so they had less losses when interest rates increased so much. Whereas this particular bank, you know, basically made a pretty big bet on long duration assets. Uh, you know, which is not not the mo not like the riskiest thing you could have done, but it is risky because um, those are relatively safe assets. But they have pricing risk, and so that bank had a particularly large amount of losses. Uh, relative to its capital, and had a very flighty deposit base, um, and so and a number of other banks that either were taken down or you know were kind of on the verge of going down had somewhat similar risk profiles, um, both in terms of the deposit side and the unrealized losses side. Uh, whereas banks that have held up better are ones with either a more diverse and larger deposit base, um, and that that have less losses because they, you know, they, they in general because they bought shorter duration uh, securities, or a lot of their assets are their own loans on their book, and therefore aren't really marked to market in the same way. Well, and when SVB had to go sell those long duration bonds, they had to mark to market. So they were at a loss. They tried to raise equity and they couldn't. So is that essentially how they collapsed that weekend? And then the government stepped in? Yeah, that's basically what happened. And then there was a big decision of whether or not they want to um, back up all depositors because most of them were uninsured. Um, but at the same time, the, the policymakers want to restore confidence in the rest of the banking system. One of the big challenges is that you know, of like the 17 trillion plus deposits uh, that are out there, you know, the, the the FDIC only has you know less than one percent of those deposits backed up by insurance. Even the ratio that is fully covered by insurance, they only have something like one point three percent covered. Now, to their credit, I mean, since 1933, they've never not paid on a insured deposit before. Um, uh, but you know, basically, the, it's one of those things that they don't want huge, vast bank runs happening. And a lot of this is a confidence game. That's kind of the whole game of fractional reserve banking is that these institutions are inherently unstable. Um, I've described it as basically like we're all just casually storing our money in leveraged bond funds. Um, and so obviously that's, you know, if, if you phrase it like that, would you say, is that a low risk investment? People would say, no, of course not. But that's what we all just casually use for our, you know, savings. Uh, you would just put grandma in a highly leveraged bond fund, and and that's where she holds her money. That's just that's we we kind of normalize that, uh, and so they wanted to backstop confidence in the system, and they've they've also added this liquidity facility. Uh, it ironically generally benefits the larger banks because you can only use that facility if you have a lot of high quality liquid assets, um, and you and whereas if you look at the you know the long tail of smaller banks. They're generally more loan driven. They hold illiquid loans that they made and that they're not really easily resellable. And so they can't use that particular facility. Um, and so I, I think we're in an environment where the large banks are pretty well protected, whereas small banks are, probably still face ongoing challenges. Is the government's intervention in this case a bailout? Partially, yes. I mean, basically, the the non insured depositors, uh, you know, they would have gotten most of their money back. Uh, but you know, based on the on the losses that the bank had, they would not have likely gotten a hundred percent of their money back. Uh, so that was a, you know, that's basically socializing losses. Basically, um, other banks are going to absorb that cost over a wider base uh, to to get those uninsured depositors whole. So that's number one. And then two, this this facility um, that the Fed and the Treasury put in place. Um, the BTSP? You know, it, exactly, yes. That facility, uh, that is sort of a bailout in the sense that it's not it's not free money, but it is uh, selective access to uh, below market credit uh, at, at above average terms. Um, so basically, it's easier credit than they otherwise would get on an on a open market basis. Now, if you zoom out, I mean, the whole system is kind of artificial, right? I mean, when when all these banks are building their system on top of the Fed and the Fed is actively managed by a, a central entity, you know, it's like both sides are bailout. The whole system is kind of one giant mm -hmm. ongoing bailout. But yes, this particular action did have, have characteristics that were at least partially a bailout. And when the president went on camera and said that taxpayers will not be paying for this, is that disingenuous? Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things around the margins. It's different than if they just outright gave the money. Um, I would say that that people are going to pay for it, not necessarily through 
through you know the the government budget they're going to pay through it by their their you know their overall cost effectiveness when using banks in general um the federal reserve's uh liquidity facility is backed up by 25 billion in um treasury capital uh to absorb any any you know losses that they might incur which which seem somewhat unlikely um, and so overall, you know, taxpayers are not really sort of taking a direct hit from this, uh, but it is it is a, a spread out cost among, you know, all market participants. So going back to the the BTFP, why are foreign banks eligible? And maybe let's touch on what's happening with Credit Suisse, because it seems like the European banks now are imploding. So foreign banks, uh, some of them have um, branches in the United States uh, and they tie into the dollar based system. And so they're they're you know they're uh, able to use that facility similar to how domestic banks can for for similar purposes, uh, because otherwise you have the long chain of offshore dollars kind of coming back and causing problems in the domestic banking system. As far as Europe is concerned, that's more of a developing story because that's really happening today. Uh, but it's kind of bringing up old wounds. I mean, you know, uh, Credit Suisse, for example, has just been this ongoing slow motion train wreck of losing deposits and you know basically it's becoming riskier and riskier losing its major investors uh, and so that that's been kind of an ongoing you know everyone kind of assumes that's eventually going to fail even though it's a systemically important bank uh the question is what what does eventually bring it down or will it be kind of um you know kind of gradually broken up and somehow you just absorb into other banks. Like, how is that? How is that going to be handled precisely? Uh, but basically, the problem is that it, it, you know, if you're a European investor, it's actually harder to get a bailout in general because there's not one country with with the you know the the government and the central bank on the same page. Instead, they have you know a bunch of different governments, and then you know at least for most of those countries, not not Switzerland, but most of the countries, they have one central bank, and so their banks are actually more at risk of a uh, basically a failure, uh, more risk of having a bail-in rather than a bail-out, which is basically where the depositors uh, bail out the bank. And so the challenge there is that every, you know, suddenly kind of overnight, everybody has to be a bank expert and has to look at their banks, you know, like, uh, you know, their financial filings and determine whether or not they feel safe holding them. You know, basically, if, if someone invests in a leveraged bond fund, you'd expect them to do a lot of due diligence on the risk of that asset. Whereas that's not, of course, how most people treat banks because, you know, they partially because they're insured, but also partially because they're just supposed to do the services we expect, even though it's actually when you look under the surface, it's actually a pretty you know, weak foundation.